Hello my fellow Hammerheads and welcome to the first law part of The Broken Realms, Morathi. In this video we will cover the dramatis personae and information you need to fully appreciate the law behind the first chapter in this book. But before we begin, I recommend that you buy and read the book and the stories for yourself. Because only this way we can support Games Workshop, the Black Library, their authors and you can enjoy the unabridged stories for yourself. As always I will provide the faction specific terminology in the description box down below. As for every new wonderful being watching this, as every video could be someone's first, these slow videos are meant to be role played. I don the mantle of a traveler who gathers information about the law and welcomes you in my newly set up Hammerhead Inn, which is located somewhere in the mortal realms. Now I won't waste any more of your time. Let's begin. Ah, hello my friend. Welcome back to the Hammerhead Inn. Please, grab yourself something to drink. I will be right with you. I see the events which are set to motion have piqued your interest. The realms are shaking and are near to the point of breaking. Everything started with a single goal. A goal formed in the mind of the High Oracle of Cain, Morathi. To become a fully fledged goddess. Jealous and angry at the other elven gods, she wanted nothing more than real power and immortality. And with a plan centuries in the making, no one will be left untouched by her machinations. Her spies are everywhere and they are gathering information wherever they can. If something is useful enough, they will bring the word to the High Oracle. It was one group of agents who told her of an intriguing development. Archaon, the three-eyed king, is harvesting the rare realm stone of the Eight Points, a substance which Morathi desires for herself. But to claim it will be a difficult and dangerous undertaking, requiring many sacrifices and meticulous planning by Morathi. I can see in your eyes that I have your attention. Realmstone is very precious to the gods. If you want, I will tell you more about it another time. For now, I will focus on this specific realmstone. It is called Varanite. Maybe you remember the short story I told you about the cursed gift a while back. Morathi's agents were able to get hold of a small amount of Varanite and bring it to her. They snatched it right in the infernal forges of Varanthrax a small. Varanthax, the great drake. No one knows how it was slain or who did the deed. But its remains lie in the eight points and many warlords fought for the colossal remains which hit an entry to a great construction complex built by unknown hands in its vast maw. The word of a Varanite mine traveled to Archaon and he dispatched one of his gaunt summoners, known as the Eater of Tomes, to secure and extract the Realmstone for himself. Under the supervision of the Eater of Tomes, the infernal industrialization grew exponentially by the day. Thousands upon thousands of slaves are worked to death just to satisfy the need of the few higher ranked. It is possible to extract the molten realm stone with titanic boar worms, whose bodies are temporarily resilient to the transmutating nature of Varanite. This resilience 
is used by the Gaunt Summoner for his vile experiments to unlock the potential of the Realm Stone. As Varonite is dangerous to touch, it is at the same time desperately sought after by the minions of Chaos. For them, Varonite is the essence of the gods. If you forgot about the transmutating nature of Varonite, again just remember the story I told you about the cursed gift. Archaon, cunning and ambitious as he is, wants to use Varonite to crack open the Ark way to Azir, the realm of heaven. With a tremendous amount of effort and wasted lives, he and his followers managed to extract and use the Varonite to corrupt the sigils and locks of the Ark way. A long and hard process began and the hour of the broken gate will soon come. This is where Morathi and her spies come into the play. Sigmar tried to infiltrate the Eight Points many times, but the Stormcast Eternals are not known for their subtlety. The Shadow Stalkers, on the other hand, are basically bred for subterfuge and reconnaissance. It was them who brought the word of the gold to corrupt the Ark way to Morathi. So, the quest in retrieving the blood of Cain, that is, what she called the Varonite, was commenced for the Daughters of Cain. With the news at hand, Morathi travelled to Sigmaron to seek an audience with the god king Sigmar himself. Despite the warnings of Tyrion and Teclis about the nature of Morathi and her silver tongue, he could not ignore her warning about Archaon's plans. Everyone knows that the High Oracle is the mother of a tyrannical god and amongst the mortals she is unrivaled in her mastery of shadow magic. Her fluid transition from distant to steadfast ally raised Sigmar's internal alarms. I already told you of her personal crusade to punish everyone who wronged her. Slanesh, the Dark Prince, the Elven Pantheon, including even her own son, Malarian. Centuries passed. Patience was a virtue of the High Oracle. And she waited for the perfect opportunity. Nagash's Necroquake and the ongoing Soul Wars offered her what she needed. Every major threat to her plans was distracted, or, in the case of Sigmar, at her own side. No one questioned that Archaon's attempts to break open the Arcway had to be stopped. The question was rather, how should they stop him? The Canine Shadow Stalkers reported that the armies of the Ever Chosen were distracted with the Oziarch Empire, who invaded the Eight Points a while back. A story which I will tell you another time. This granted the Alliance an opening to strike. With their numbers stretched, the armies of Order had to strategize on how to invade enemy territory. Murathi, cunning as ever, told Sigmar that her agents are already working on a solution as they don't need to commit to a war of attrition. Splitting into two forces, they would venture into the Eight Points and destroy the pulsing heart of Archaon's minds, the Varonite itself. Together, Morathi and Sigmar's arcane experts would open a tear into the etheric void, the great nothingness between the realm spheres, so no one would stand in chance to recover it. With no other allies, Zygma had to agree. He did not trust her, but he had to agree. Together, they gathered as many troops as possible, and many storm hosts of Zygma's warrior chambers heeded the call. Morathi even acquired the help of the anvils of the Heldenhammer, even though they left their storm keep in Anvilgard short on defenders. Meanwhile, her shadow stalkers were hard at work 
preparing the invasion of the combined forces, and, unknown to everyone else, a few agents were on the hunt for an infamous artifact. The Ocarian Lantern. I don't know how the words correlate, but it may have something to do with the Okari Dara. I guess the root of the words Oka means something like high, as the Okari Dara means spirefall, and the Okarian Lantern contains glittering sun modes plucked from the tapestry of Haish itself. So, something elevated, I guess. But I digress. The High Oracle first laid her eyes on the lantern, then the elven pantheon drew the tortured elven souls from Slanesh's belly. Teclis created it for this purpose, and with its power he created the Kaitai. As you might remember, the Kaitai were forced to flee Haish, and wisely they chose to steal the Okarian lantern, otherwise Teclis would have used it to lure them back and finish his deed. Deep beneath the Maithna Sea, which lies in Gairan, the Kaitai hid the lantern so deep, it is said that the sea itself bleeds into the etheric void out of the realm sphere. The smothering darkness of the sea was enough for them to think the lantern might be safe. But the Shadow Stalkers are able to use the lack of light to travel to any place they wish to be. With the help of a Black Ark Fleet Master, who secretly is an old ally of Morathi, the Shadow Stalkers were the only ones to procure the lantern. With magical wards, they ventured forth, but only a single Shadow Stalker survived and brought the Okarian lantern back to Morathi. After that, the Shroud Queen disappeared into the Umbral Web. With the invasion plans at hand, Sigma and Morathi had to find a way to send their forces into the Eight Points, as the usual way was not possible. The usual way meaning riding the celestial storms and crashing to the ground with a lightning strike. The only viable way was the Arcway named the Genesis Gate, located in Gairan which was closed by Sigma and Alariel during the Realmgate Wars. An eventful time in our collective past, I will tell you more about it in another meeting of ours. Alariel was reluctant to open the Arcway, but Morathi's silver tongue convinced the Everqueen to join forces. As their male counterparts in the Elven Pantheon were too busy to isolate themselves, and the protection of their people lay in the hands of the Ever Queen and the High Oracle. Alariel agreed, but only to open the Arcway. Her forces were stretched thin in the defense of her kingdom. With an ingenious plan, Alariel, despite the lack of her army, crushed the defenders of the Arcway, and the combined troops of the Canite Sigmarite forces could invade the eight points. After the initial attack, Morathi brought her cauldrons of blood, as these death shrines were vital in the ritual to get rid of the Varanite once and for all. As they had the need to move fast, the majority of the forces were left behind to defend the Ark Way, and only a small strike force was dispatched into Varan Thraxus Moor. Led by Morathi herself, and a sacrosanct chamber led by an agent of Sigma, who did not trust Morathi fully, and he needed another pair of eyes to watch after the High Oracle. The way from the Genesis Gate to Warren Thraxus Moor was long and bloody, but with a bit of luck, the Oziark Bone Reapers, under the rule of Catacross, the Mortark of the Necropolis, invaded the Eight Points not long ago and they started to attack the forces of Chaos almost simultaneously. Morathi sold it as a fortunate happenstance, that Catacross may be used their attack to gain an advantage for himself. In truth, the High Oracle and the Mortag had a pact 
in which Catacross would launch his attacks against Chaos, while Morathi and her allies were fighting their way to the Varanite Mines. Everything went according to Morathi's plans. As the attention of the Chaos worshippers was mainly focused on the larger forces of order, Morathi's fight was no less dangerous than her companions. Following the invisible glyphs of her shadow stalkers, Morathi led the troops into the deepest parts of the moor. Three enormous boar worms slurped the liquid realm zone up, and as this deposit was nearly drained, the worms were full with Varanite. Armored, Chaos warriors and marauders attacked the invaders, while Sigmar's agent, the leading Lord Arcanum, fortified the walkways. Morathi started to call upon the shadow magic of Ulwu, drawing it out of the ether. The sacrosanct chamber and Morathi were divided in the battle, and everyone had to fight for themselves. Morathi still weaving her illusory spells. The Lord Arcanum was the only one to see through the illusion. The High Oracle's forces were retreating, leaving the Stormcast Eternals behind and surrounded by all sides. And before she could sound the alarm of betrayal, she was backstabbed, unable to do anything. Meanwhile, the cauldrons of blood were placed beneath the boar worms, and as Morathi cut them open with her trusted spear Heart Render, the Varanite was collected and secretly transported to the Math Core, Morathi's mother cauldron in Hagnar. Ordering a fighting retreat, the High Oracle of Cain obtained enough Varanite to fulfill that which she desires most. On the top side, the battle took a turn which all the participants of the Army of Order had hoped would not happen. The forces of Sigma and Morathi were hard pressed by the largest Chaos army they had encountered up until then. Even with the prospect of reinforcements, the situation was dire, as they had to win time for Morathi to fulfill her task. To better understand the upcoming events, I have to introduce three individuals to you. The first, Lord Veritant, Kaiser Van Brecht, a vampire hunter without mercy. He was assigned to investigate rumors of corruption in Anvilgard, but was ordered to fight in this war for the Varanite. He and his forces were on the march to reinforce their friends and allies. The next individual is the entity known as Glavia Sinhart, the Eater of Dreams. A demon so high in the favor of the Dark Prince Slanish that he gifted it the ability to visit the dreams of their enemies. But since Slanish's imprisonment, Sinhart was subjected to certain visions which led it to this point in time, as it believed would lead to the path to free the prince. It was Glavia who had seen the march of the Order army out of the Genesis Gate and went to warn the third individual. He is known as Idolator Lord Rokar Gresh, leader of the warband called the Crimson Brethren, and he believes that he has been chosen by the Chaos Gods to guard the entrance to Varenthraxus Moor. So they had a pilgrimage to the Varanite Mines just to see that the battle already started. The fight was long and brutal, and as time advanced, the forces of Chaos would prove that they had the numbers to take their enemies down, and even the Gaunt Summoner, known as the Eater of Tomes, unleashed his plans upon the Cainite Sigmarite forces. Only through the intervention of Kaiser Van Brecht's reinforcements there was a glimmer of hope, but it is only a glimmer. I won't go into any more details about what happened in that battle, as I am tired and have to rest. And also, 
I don't trust the writings of a newly reforged Stormcast Eternal anyways. They are what I like to call the unreliable narrator. They are too boasting about their own actions. But it is an enjoyable read. I recommend it. Also, I think that it is better if you read Wembrecht's recollections for yourself. I hope my attempts to prepare you for the upcoming events were successful. I'm keen to know what you think about everything I told you. Just leave me a note under my table. I hope you will lend your ear to my stories again. I have many more for you to quench your thirst for knowledge. You just have to listen for the bell. And you will know that I am here again, waiting for you. Have a good night, friend. And please, stay fantastic. Bye.